Today on Rock the Park, staring up at the night sky, you are looking back 100,000 years into the past. We're exploring the hidden power of nature. You could hear it ringing through your skull. To shock us. Oh, yeah! Challenge us. I think we gotta talk about this, dude, not just keep going. And shake us to our very core. How are you feeling? I'm nervous. I'm incredibly nervous right now. The greatest lessons come when we embrace nature's unexpected surprises. Oh, man, I could almost break down into tears right now. And it all starts right now. I'm Jack Stewart. This is the real deal. And I'm Colton Smith. These are mountains! We've been buddies for years. Always in search of the next adventure. Dude, what was that? We share a passion for our national parks and other wild places around the world. Oh my god. Man. Heading off the beaten path. Pushing our limits and experiencing nature's best kept secrets. Here we go! <laughs> it's how we rock the park. Years of exploring the national parks have taught us that being outdoors isn't always about grand adventure or crossing experiences off a bucket list. It's also about finding quiet places to reflect and recharge. For me, I know just the place to go. Welcome to my favorite place on earth. This is my camp right on the outskirts of Death Valley National Park. Every time I get to this camp or drive into this park, I'm just hit with this overwhelming sense of hope and joy. Death Valley covers 3.4 million acres of California desert along the Nevada border. Sitting 282 feet below sea level at its lowest point, it's one of the hottest and most barren environments on the planet. So how did this remote spot in the desert become my favorite place on Earth? It really stems from about three years ago, I came to Death Valley unsure of myself. I was feeling like I didn't have a sense of purpose. And I came to this camp right here, sat out under the stars, and spent my first night out completely alone, just me and nature. And it was an experience that changed my life forever. It was right here that I first caught a glimpse of who I am and why I'm on this earth. Death Valley has now become my home away from home, a refuge I return to time and again to reconnect with nature and reflect on my place in the world. And today, I'm showing Colton all the places I explored that first time in Death Valley, and together, we're looking back on all the other destinations on Earth that challenged and changed us. That is so imperative, to have a place where you can actually hear yourself think, where you can make sense of it all. And in this day and age, those places are hard to find. Two years ago, we discovered another place like that during our first trip to Japan. We'd learned a thousand-year-old meditation requiring you to be still beneath a freezing cold waterfall. So there we were, wandering up a remote jungle creek in search of the falls. I'm really excited about this. Um, one of the ways that I find mental clarity just in life is I withdraw into nature and I practice meditation. I do it frequently. I try to work to be present and live in the moment, but I think part of what meditation is is taking yourself to a different place. Oh, I think I can hear it. Wow. It's absolutely perfect, too. There's two little streams, oh one my for you, gosh. one for me. I've got so many emotions right now. I can't tell if I'm happy, excited, or fearful. This but it is, is so beautiful, my gosh. Ta Falls drops about 65 feet in twin streams of ice cold water. But we didn't come just to look. Our goal is to spend as much time as we possibly can in this meditation. So we'll see how long that is. Yes. <laughs> Without risking hypothermia. <laughs> I remember when I first saw the falls, I had this big smile on my face. I was so ready to just dive into this meditation. And then the second I got into that water, it was like a slap across the face. I had no idea how cold that was gonna be. I felt that water and it just shocked me. I could barely breathe and I thought, oh, there's no way I'm gonna be able to do this for 10 seconds, let alone 10 minutes. I could just feel the force of that current just 
splatting against my head. You could hear it ringing through your skull. Oh, yeah! I was ready to leave. I was done. And as I started making my way back to shore, my realization was, you do belong underneath that waterfall. What doesn't belong is your pride. The moment I was able to let go of my pride was the moment that I summoned this posture of humility, of finding that sense of reverence and respect for nature and the experience that was being delivered to me. And once I came to that realization that this is not a challenge, I wasn't there anymore. I wasn't underneath that waterfall. I was in something so much greater. When I came out of that peaceful moment, just a giant load of water was dropped on my back and instantly my eyes were open. But I remember walking out and turning back and seeing you, and you just remain unchanged. I remember thinking of all the things that I'm grateful for in my life. I thought about all the loved ones that I have in my life, all of the experiences, the good and the bad, and how they've built me into the person that I am today. Before I knew it, I had found that sense of peace that I didn't even know was possible. It's incredible the ability that we possess with just our minds. And I don't know about you, I never expected to have some of those revelations take place in Japan, underneath a waterfall. That meditation gave me a glimpse of a greater theme in my life, of being able to stand strong through struggle with a greater sense of purpose and identity. And that moment definitely changed my life. Oh, what do you say? Should we break camp and hit the road? Let's do it. Okay. Jack's about to show me a place he calls the Mountain of Faith. Only you can't find it on any map. I'm not exactly sure where Jack's taking me. All I know is that it's some place that's very, very special to him. Death Valley is the largest national park in the lower 48 states. 91% of that space is open, trailless wilderness, meaning if there's something you're inspired to explore, you'll have to find your own way there. This is it? This is it. All right, man, follow me. Today, we're rediscovering some of the places that have offered Jack inspiration on his solo adventures here. Death Valley is a place that encourages wandering. It's that trailless system that lets you go your own way. We're on the east side of the park, just off Highway 191. The first time I came here, I was looking for a way to escape the heat of the lower elevations. What I didn't know was what I would encounter higher up. I spotted a coyote in the distance and a few tarantulas. One of the things that I think is so unique about nature in our national parks are their ability to just force you into situations where you have to face your fears. That instantly makes me think of Sahali Peak in North Cascades. That was the first time where I faced a fear of mine head on. When we first started exploring the national parks, Jack and I tackled what was then the most harrowing climb of our lives, a summit of the 8,600-foot Mount Sahali in North Cascades National Park. For me, it was adventure of the highest order. For Colton, it was a mental battle with a crippling fear of heights. Starting early from our base camp at nearly 5,000 feet with another 3,000 vertical feet to go and a glacier to cross, I knew I'd have some hard truths to face before that day was done. Peak's getting closer. It's like we've got a little more glacier to go across and then uh, a little rock. Uh, this, is, this is pretty intense. As we began, I wasn't scared at all. In fact, I was kind of surprised. Like, okay, this is nothing. I've got this just one step at a time. And then, man, we, we got to the ridge. And I took one look over to the other side and all I saw was just nothing. Just a drop of thousands of feet. It was something out of a movie. It's like every emotion, every fear I had just came rushing to the forefront of my mind. This is way steeper than I thought it was gonna be and uh, this is just insane. How are you feeling? I'm nervous, I'm incredibly nervous right now. I've seen you absolutely petrified by your fear of heights and in that moment, I had no idea whether you were gonna continue or not. Makes two of us. <laughs> we had good support up there. I mean, Martin was in control. As long as I don't say anything, we're moving together. And when I say stop, don't move a little bit, just like wait right there. I'm freaking out a little. 
This is insane. Now, how do we get up this? Yeah, you, yeah, there you go. There you go. There you go, man. Where's my next handhold? I'm gonna go for that. Yeah, I think that's okay. Oh my gosh. There you go. Okay. <laughs> Nicely done. <laughs> hold on, just hold on, dude. Oh my nice God. Good job, dude. Woo! We oh did it. My gosh. Oh, wow. The view up here is absolutely spectacular. That was the most insane thing I've ever, I've ever done in my life. Easily. It's incredibly spiritual to overcome such a deep fear. It's hard to put into words. It's something where you got to test your own limits and you got to see it for yourself. Oh man, I could almost break down into tears right now because that was a big feat for me. Sahali Peak for both of us was the first time that we'd ever stared down a challenge like that. It was the biggest challenge of our lives. And to stand on the summit of that mountain and look out over everything that we had climbed was the most empowering feeling in the world. That final section of that mountain was probably about 100 feet, man, but the ways that I grew that day completely transcended that climb. It's something that I've carried around with me ever since I stood on top of that summit. Well, speaking of mountains, you ready to get to the top of this one? It's a little, little shorter. Yeah, a little, little more tame. Yeah. For <laughs> that, jeez. All right, follow me. All right. Climbing mountains can be dangerous work, whether it's in the desert or the wild Alaskan backcountry. I think we gotta talk about this, dude, not just keep going. We're exploring Death Valley, Jack's favorite national park, and taking in some of the places that have offered him inspiration over the years. I'm not exactly sure where Jack's taking me. All I know is that it's some place that's very, very special to him. Hidden in this valley is a peak I call the Mountain of Faith. Mountain of Faith, how do you arrive on that? I don't know, mountains just represent faith to me. It's just that thing that drives you forward. But also this spot for me sort of gave me that glimpse of hope that the path ahead doesn't have to be scary, that something greater lies around the corner. And, and honestly, from up here, I'd say it does. What I love about Death Valley is it is a dynamic landscape, but it's also a place of extremes where you really have to be on your toes and prepared out here. Averaging just over two inches of rain a year, bordered by mountains that trap dry, hot air masses, temperatures here can top 130 degrees in the summer. It's truly a place where you have to pay attention to the signs nature is giving you. It almost reminds me of Katmai in the Valley of 10,000 Smokes. A year ago in Alaska, we journeyed deep into Katmai National Park, seeking out one of the last fumaroles or steam vents left in the Valley of 10,000 Smokes. Getting there meant trekking 10 miles over roaring rivers and vast valleys of rock and ash to the base of Mount Griggs, a still active volcano. There's a giant cloud that's sitting right on the top of Mount Griggs. If you focus in closely enough, you're gonna see steam. It's high. Oh, we've got it. So far, the weather looks okay. I say we avoid snow at all costs. My goal is to get up there and get down before any bad weather comes in. The stakes were high. We had nearly 4,000 feet of volcanic ash and boulders to cover and no clear route to get there. Climbing up that mountain, I remember just stepping through ash, sinking down. Step after step after step, you would just sink backwards. We were the only ones in that 40 square mile valley. It was just us out there, setting our sights on our target and just trying to find the best way to get there. So here's what I'm thinking we do. We gain that ridge. Yeah, and right. hopefully once we get up there, we have another one that zigzags over towards the fumarole. We're starting to see the color of the ash change. And now we're entering in to an area with massive volcanic boulders. I remember hiking up the mountain that day, just seeing the blue skies, everything was perfect. And then within an instant, the conditions just changed. The wind started to blow, the snow started to fall. Oh man. We were stuck, hemmed in by brutal weather and a treacherous snow field packed with crevasses that could swallow us in an instant. Something I know about you is once you get a goal in your head, you go after it. And I remember you we were just marching forward. The wind was blowing, the snow was coming down, we were getting socked in. I couldn't see 
a hundred yards ahead of me. And I'm thinking, this is insane. I think we gotta talk about this, dude, not just keep going. If you look closely, you could see a little bit of steam coming up right over that ridge. With every step, the smell of sulfur is just becoming stronger and stronger. You can see it again. Oh, it's right there. Gosh, is it? Oh, man. We might have a little window here. Yeah. If we're going to try to get closer, we got to go now. Let's go for it. Oh. Here's the fact of the matter, dude. I am very afraid of crossing that snow field because if we slip, we're gonna go down and down and down and down and down. Something happens up here, we are a long ways from help. The wind was smacking me in the face. I remember the ash being absolutely kicked up and thrown back right at me. I wanted so badly to reach that fumarole, but what I actually needed was a lesson in humility, knowing when to call it quits. Nature will give us warnings. And on that day, surrounded by blistering wind and ash, we listened to those warnings. 150 feet from our goal, we decided to play it safe. I think so many times we get caught up in this idea of pushing out of our comfort zone and tackling these challenges, but when it really comes down to it, what's really important is our lives. It's being able to walk away and be able to tell that story and be able to come back again. I think we probably learned more about nature, about ourselves, by saying it's time to stop. That adventure is always gonna be calling and waiting. You need to think about what's smart, what's safe. And when you make those decisions, you live to fight another day. Surrendering to the power of nature can open you up to endless possibilities of discovery. Have you ever wished you could travel backwards in time? Here in the desert, it's easier than you might think. It's like the first question would be, where am I? Years exploring the national parks have provided us endless space for adventure and self-discovery. As day turns to night in Death Valley, those discoveries take on a whole new light. One of my favorite things to do here is to walk out onto the open desert and watch the sun go down and the stars come out. It's an absolutely surreal experience. Sitting 120 miles from any major city or light source, Death Valley has become known as one of America's greatest parks for stargazing. We have just become so used to all of the street lights and the city lights that block out the stars like this, that coming out here seems like a foreign experience to us, but honestly, this is the truest experience in reality you can have. It's pure. I mean, this is how things were intended to be. Looking up at a star, you're looking at light that took thousands, even millions of years to reach Earth. Think about it. So by just staring up at the night sky, you are as close to time traveling as humanly possible, looking back 100,000 years into the past. What's incredible is that the Milky Way is estimated at being about 13 billion years old. That's how old our galaxy is. Our solar system with its sun and planets is just a tiny part of the enormous Milky Way galaxy. Here on Earth, we're only seeing the smallest portion of it. Within the Milky Way galaxy, there are about 100 to 400 billion stars just in our galaxy. How many more are out in the universe <laughs> that just goes on and on and on? I think oftentimes we forget to look up and connect with the universe, which is always hovering above us. That's why it's so important to come out to places like this, because when you feel that connection, everything is grander. Every takeaway is larger and more impactful, and you carry that with you. Nature continues to teach me humility because it is always offering me an experience that I wasn't expecting. In Japan, I had no idea that that meditation would teach me so much about personal struggle and the ability to find peace within it. And for me, Sahali taught me that even in the face of my greatest fears, if I persevered, I could overcome them. A single day can teach you so much. I think Mount Griggs was really a moment where we had to come together and realize that some things are just more important than your bucket list. We were never meant to conquer nature, and we never will. But ultimately, the greatest lessons are learned by just being. That's when you gain the most out of not just these places, but you get the most out of life. Hey, if we can do it, so can you.
So the next chance you get, go out and rock the park. everybody thanks for watching make sure to leave any questions or comments that you have and please subscribe to the channel there's a lot more to come